Welcome to The Child is the Teacher, A Life of Maria Montessori. This is the title of the English translation of Il Bambino e il Maestro by Cristina De Stefano. Uh, the book, the translation, is coming out in one week on uh, March the 8th, and it is a very interesting biography about uh, the fascinating life of pedagogist Maria Montessori. And in my opinion, this is the perfect event to celebrate March, today is March the 1st, uh, Women's History Month. So, benvenute e, e happy History Month. Uh, this event is part of the series Libriamo from Italy with Books, organized by our bookstore, in partnership with Friends of Italian Cultural Center Boston and under the auspices of the Consulate General of Italy in Boston. I am Chiara Durazzini, the event coordinator at the bookstore I Am Books that just reopened in the North End in Boston, so come and visit. Welcome everyone and let's start with our consul Federica Sereni. Welcome Federica e buona festa della donna anche a te. Grazie, grazie Chiara. Eh, grazie eh, and good evening everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this very exciting event on the figure of Maria Montessori. Um, a remarkable woman and acclaimed educator for her innovative educational methods of teaching children. Uh, as most of you I'm sure know, her teachings were focused on the principle that children possessed a natural curiosity, uh, the will to learn. Uh, so learning was something that was spontaneous, that was innate, and that was not to be, um, let's say, um, pressed on from the outside. It was something that uh, children spontaneously uh, were drawn to. So I think that um, the principle that led her belief that education was essential and important um, was also its role uh, in world peace. Uh, Maria Montessori uh, wrote many articles and books on the theme of peace. And um, as I'm sure you all are very well aware, I think that the theme of peace um, is something that we really need to focus on today. As we witness what is going on in the news, uh, I think that this is a very appropriate time to reflect on uh, what is happening and on Maria Montessori's conviction that teaching children a specific set of values such as personal responsibility, global citizenship, and respect for diversity um, is all the more essential today. And I think it's our duty to foster these teaching and teaching our children and children in general, um, these principles uh, in their everyday lives. Uh, I think, as, I mean, I think, and many think, as all of you know, that education is essential in growing responsible citizens and in fostering peace. And we all want a peaceful world for our children. So um, I want to greet you all. I'm very happy that this uh, event uh, is taking place. I'm very thrilled that I Am Books is back on track and in operation and that Chiara is uh, helping um, you know, the activities. Uh, so I would like to welcome um, Cristina De Stefano and Gina Maiellaro. Uh, and I would like to end um, with a quote from Maria Montessori. Uh, and I will read it in Italian and translate it in English because I think that we have such a beautiful language uh, that you know, I would like to read the few words in their original language. Tutti parlano di pace, ma nessuno educa la pace. So everyone talks about peace, but no one educates for peace. Le persone educano la competizione, e questo è l'inizio di qualsiasi guerra. People educate for competition, and this is the beginning of war. Quando educhiamo a cooperare ed essere solidali l'uno con l'altro, quel giorno educheremo per la pace. When we educate to cooperate and be in solidarity with one another, that way, that day, we will be educating for peace. And I think that no words express better what we are experiencing today. So thank you. Grazie Chiara, ti cedo la parola. Oh, I'm moved. 
really it's a hard time and these words are beautiful so thank you thank you so much federica for telling us and uh and uh, and translating it too and and saying it in italian which i agree sounded beautiful um so now let me introduce our special guests we have cristina de stefano and i will briefly uh read their biographies uh, Cristina De Stefano is a journalist and writer. She lives and works in Paris, but I think she's now in Italy, if I'm not mistaken, as a literary scout for many publishing houses around the world. Her books, Belinda e il Mostro, Vita Segreta di Cristina Campo, 2002, and Americane Avventurose, 2007, has been translated into French, German, Spanish, and Polish. Her biography, Oriana Fallaci, the journalist, the agitator, the legend was published by other press in 2017. And also we have uh, Professor Gina Maiellaro. She is a teaching professor and coordinator of the Italian program at Northeastern University. Her primary teaching and research areas are Italian language pedago pedagogy or pedagogy, linguistics and history of language. Her academic research explore explores a second language acquisition with a special focus on language testing and assessment, curriculum development and intercultural communicative competence. Gina is actively involved in, with national and local associations, promoting and supporting the teaching of Italian language and cultures in the United States. She's the director of the AATI, National Italian Exam, a well-established proficiency-based exam for high school students. She's also currently member of the board of directors of Massachusetts Italian Teachers Association. So welcome, uh, Christina, and welcome, Gina. And let's start our chatting and conversation about this amazing figure that is uh, Maria Montessori. I must say that I read the book and I was so surprised about what an amazing personality, a strong woman, sometimes a little controversial. Uh, I, my fault, I didn't know much about her and now I do. <laughs> so yes, uh, let me now, in fact, share with you some photos that I put together of Maria so that we can, you know, uh, maybe begin to see see what she was like. Okay, let me see if I can share. If I can do the slideshow, that would be great. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. You see the slides or you see the... The first slide, I see. Ah, okay. All right. So I, I think I'll have to go like that because I don't know why this Zoom for me does mm -hmm. not work with this slideshow. So, and let me also, if I can do it, read another quote, because I like this quote very much. The principle of slavery pervades pedagogy, and therefore the same principle pervades the school. I need only give one proof. The stationary desks and chairs the schools were at first furnished with the long, narrow benches upon which the children were crowded together. Then came science and perfected the bench. The distance between the seat and the desk was calculated with infinite care. The seats were separated so that the children might be separated from his neighbor or her neighbor. 
these desks are constructed in such a way as to render the child visible in all his immobility. Uh, or if you wish, repress every moment of the child. And I end with this. If you guys remember the Lira, right? We are uh -huh. holding right all right so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the method montessori just to give an introduction about it and then let's go to the to the historical figure of maria yeah is uh, chiara i think you uh, i can the, the the citations the reference that you just made was uh, from um i think the first translation of montessori's um um treaties on on our method and the in and i we chose it because it was very revolutionary i mean to talk about slavery and to talk about children being immobile and uh, trying to repress verbs like again you know in the in, in the citations she uses repression slavery immobility invisibility versus visibility so uh, for um this is a quite revolutionary statement, I think, about pedagogy, especially if we think that it was written in 1909, approximately. And, uh, and so why Montessori? I guess maybe we can start the conversation uh, for, with Cristina. Why did Montessori did not like, why she didn't like, didn't like the stationary desks? Uh, is, what, what does the, the stationary desks stand for in her view? And, 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 and so I, I found that as a, as, a, as a starting point to, to, to explore her, um, her pedagogy. What do you think, Cristina? But the Montessori uh, very early said that a child has to move to learn. And that seems normal today, but at that time was very new. Uh, neuroscience today confirmed this. So Maria Montessori uh, was very um, clear on this. She, she, she was always saying that the child is born to learn. Uh, and the only thing that the adult have to do is to try to avoid, to interfere with his own process of learning. Uh, which means that, which doesn't mean that the adult is uh, useless in the process, uh, but the adult has to, to do something very difficult for an adult, stay calm, stay silent and respect the child. Uh, because sometimes for Maria Montessori, you, you interfere even when you want to help or you want to encourage or you want to say bravo, this is bad for her because she said, if you, enter the process of learning, you, you interrupt something very, very special, which is going on in, in the mind. And talking about a desk, of course, she was, uh, I was listening to this quote, and I was thinking that that's why Maria Montessori was a very difficult person for her time, because she didn't want to reform the school. She wanted to destroy the school and start from scratch. Uh, she, was, she was not a reformer, she was very radical, uh, too radical for her time, and probably also for today. And that's why it was difficult for her to, to, to be heard. She was, she was convinced that we have to change from the basis the school. And for example, she was saying that school is, is a, an, um, a place thought by adults. Uh, for a teacher to talk, and it's not a place thought for the ch children. Of course, um, one century and a half has passed since th that time, so luckily a lot of things have changed and school is more, let's say, um, prepared for the children. No? And so we have to think that when she was talking, she was talking in, in, another, in another time when school was really a kind of a prison for, for a child. Today, everything has changed, but still, uh, I think the, she's still very radical because uh, her idea, I always use this image, uh, it's not the Montessori, it's me, but I, I, I think that for Maria Montessori, the child is like a, like, like a, 
a different creature, like a, a, a wild animal compared to, to a man. So you have the, the, the choice between having a traditional school, which is a kind of a zoo, you put this wild animal in a cage. The cage can be big, it can be uh, nice, but it's still a cage to control the child. Or you, you can try to have a safari where the child move and learn in freedom, not in captivity. And, and the adults uh, drive little cars around the, 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 the lion and you know, the giraffes without interfering. So I think this is the difference, uh, learning captivity or learning uh, in a situation of freedom. Yeah, so freedom is important. But sometimes, Christina, when people, uh, freedom, oh, sometimes, I think in, in throughout the, the, the years and, and still today sometimes, people might think of Montessori's method as the method of freedom. Uh, and 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 probably uh, over the years, this has also raised some misunderstandings for what she really meant by freedom. Um, it, do you want to elaborate a little bit in in the sense absolutely. it's freedom, but not completely freedom, right? Absolutely. It's not. It's not anarchy. Absolutely, she was. <laughs> right. She was even uh, accused by libertarians to be too strict. So it, it's not at all the idea of do what you want. It's the, I would say is is the other way around. Maria Montessori. Um, uh, she was not an ideology, so I, it's not good to say she's convinced because she, she doesn't start from her own idea. She starts from the observation of the children. We have always to remember that she, was, she wasn't a school teacher. She was a doctor and a scientist. So by observing the children, she, she develops, developed this idea that the child has an inner sense of what she has he has to do to learn and to work with material. So if you put the child in the right environment, prepared, let's say, with the prepared material and with the prepared adult, adult in a very natural way and very fast, the child begin to, to act um, in a very, uh, I would say, ordinata, um, ordered way. So it, this is not freedom. It's just that everything is very uh, harmonic. And, and not because you have given the child some rules, like don't move, don't shout, but because if you put the child in, in, a, in a certain situation, it naturally goes with all this. Uh, so not, Maria Montessori uh, is not talking about freedom as a value. She's saying, we have to let the, the child uh, behave and we have to intervene, of course, when there are problems or when there are fights. But in general, we, we have to, uh, it's like, a, like a, let's say, a, a natural um, uh, process uh, for her learn the, the, the self-education of the ch child. So the concept is, of freedom is always, is always um, difficult to, to to target in Montessori because it's not, it's like peace, I would say. It's not an idea. Montessori uh, talk about um, teaching in peace, not teaching the peace because it's not an idea, no? She said, for example, it's stupid that you have a traditional school where you oppress the child or you give notes or you, and then at a certain moment when he's a teenager, he say, you say, okay, now let's talk about peace. She said, it's the other way around. You have to, to, to let the child, uh, uh, let's say, to, to, to respect the child and he will, he will grow up in peace as a peaceful person as an harmonic person so i would say i think that the the freedom is is the same he, she's not thinking about an idea is thinking about something that she saw and right. uh, just as a as an example when in the first time in the casa dei bambini in rome people were, were saying that he was hypnotizing the children because that's what's happening at the time she was so good in creating this situation that these little children, very poor, analphabetic, was full of, uh, how you say, um, pidocchi, they became <laughs> like little prince, princes and princesses, very, you know, concentrated, very calm. And 
it was difficult to understand this big change, but this big change was inside the child because the, child, the children all of a sudden were, were in, a, in a different situation. So I, I would say um, it's very important every time to remember that she, she's not at all a theor theorician. Maria Montessori never start from an idea. And that's why I think she's, she's very different from the other pedagogies. Because in general, even a very good pedagogist start from an idea. So, and for Maria Montessori, she's quite, uh, she's, she's very open to observation and she can change her mind uh, during the process. Yes, and what, what you were talking about, uh, the question of the, the idea of observation is crucial for her because, I mean, she was a, a physician, she studied as a doctor, and, and then she also took that course in anthropology, so she was interested in, in uh, edu educational anthropology or ethnography to an extent, and also she lived in a time where positivism was really the overarching sort of um, approach to anything and, and she kept it throughout. And she and that's that's what I, I completely agree. All the pedagogists that you, in any other field, in, as a matter of fact, even my in, in second language acquisition, which is the area that I mostly uh, research, um, do really start from, from, from ideas. Although I have to say when I, I, I uh, read your book and when I was um, learning a bit more about the Montessori, this idea of liberation from, uh, or this um, idea of slavery getting away from a pre-established, uh, you know, uh, considering the child as a container where you can put something in it. Uh, and instead using observation and most of that as an ethnographer to uh, understand what is the method. It's, it's something that really resonated in me. So it's, it's, um, it is really very, very uh, new for, it is new for, 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 for now and I imagine at the time. And, and this it's also new. new. Incredible. <laughs> It's yeah. still new. It's, it's still new. Good. For example, the heroin, I find it extremely still new. It's the, it's the error correction, right? When you, so the children are, can, you know, for, this is interesting because in my field, for example, um, um, probably about 20 years ago or so, maybe a little bit more, um, the idea of correcting students uh, when they learn a second language uh, uh, was um, considered something that wasn't positive. That is to say, yeah, you can correct, but the students are not going to learn. So there is the it started a whole trend of uh, different approaches and how you deal with error with students. And when I was reading Montessori, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> this is Montessori was already essentially saying something like that. Do you agree or do you, about errors and yeah, errors? Sorry, I was uh, walking, <laughs> looking at that. Now, error is uh, is one of example of when when uh, of uh, Maria Montessori being quite revolution revolutionary for a time because she was very clear on this. She was saying she she said that we don't have to be afraid of error because error is a uh, is a way of understanding no it's a truth if you are, if you didn't understand something and you make a mistake you you realize this so for, for the child as not to be doesn't have to be afraid of making a mistake and um, that's why the material of maria montessori the, the pedag pedagogical material uh, um, as he said is self correcting the ch the child gets by himself that is doing right, wrong and correct himself and I think this is very deep because I think creative people are people that they are not afraid of making mistakes. If you, if you don't make mistakes, you don't change things. Uh, and so, uh, especially today uh, with uh, a world which is uh, very challenging with the climate change, with the metaversus, I think we need creative people. We need the, the, the new adults to be creative people. So I don't want to, you know, to, to make a sermon, of course, that the, the normal school is great. But if you, if you give this um, message to a little child that you can explore with your inner power and that you can make a mistake and that's not bad because you will find a way, probably you will 
let's say you will um, encourage creativity to stay with him because you know Pablo Picasso said famously every child is an artist the problem is to stay to, to remain an artist when you get when you grow up and which is completely true no uh, every child has, <laughs> is a surprise all the time so um, a Montessori approach can can let's say keep this creativity process in the in the adult adult that's the idea so yeah. that's why the mistake is absolutely central in our pedagogy is not at all a problem. No, it's not. And, and it looks like in some schools, it is still. Uh, at some, you know, most of teachers look for the mistake and they detract points and mistake is, but, uh, but for Montessori it wasn't as it is not, as we discovered in cycle language acquisition, it is a way through which you rewire re your brain and that's the only way you can learn as a matter of fact so that's that is one one fantastic um uh, similitude that i found um well yeah, the, the, it's interesting because the book starts with little maria as a young girl that goes to school and she's terrible right she can't stand it she can't stand it uh she 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 gets bad grades and and so she let's say that she has the first encounter with school with the school system as it was in the late 1800s uh pretty bad <laughs> so i was surprised about that already um so let's talk a little bit about this amazing figure that is maria montessori because her biography her life is pretty complicated pretty convoluted um, tell us a little bit about her and her, let's start from the childhood, where she was born and, and what her childhood was like. Yeah, the the first, first thing we have to keep in mind is that she was born in 1870. She was born in the Victorian time. She was really a woman of another time. And it's difficult to understand today what it was like to be born at that time. She was born in a, um, let's say, a middle-class family. Um, she moved very, she moved very, she was very, she moved to Rome when she was five and she grew up as a only child in, in this family. And uh, she was bad at school, as we said uh, at the beginning. And she, she, she was quite uh, strong-minded because she was one of the few women at the time to to go to get to, to go to university and to become a doctor, which was uh, quite rare at the time, and um, I think one of the, the big surprise for me working on on this book was discovering a uh, I would say revolutionary background. Uh, Maria Montessori was not only a doctor. When she was a young uh, student, she was very she was really a militant for change. Uh, a feminist, uh, a philanthropist. She was working in the poor district of Rome. She was doing a um, voluntary job as a doctor. Uh, she was uh, a militant of, for, uh, for the vote of women. So she, she had this idea of changing the world. And in fact, at a certain point, all of this apparently disappeared to let place to the pedagogy, let's say mission, pedagogical mission. But I, I think, um, that in fact, she didn't give up this idea of changing the world. She just probably um, put all this effort in a deeper uh, sense of change. Because one thing is to change the law of your country or to change the, the culture of the, the position of the women, etc. But if you manage to, to imagine a new kind of school, you can probably build a new kind of mankind so in the end she didn't lose this idea she just um, let's say she 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 put her idea of revolution in uh, in more in the in the de developing of the, the the human nature uh, so that for me was a big surprise i didn't know about this part of, of her life and then once she she went in she she got into the pedagogy she 
I would say she spent the whole life doing that. She was a, a woman of work, 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 uh, which is no, no, the thing which is very interesting and new and probably not, not a lot of people uh, know about this is that Maria Montessori uh, started as a doctor uh, for, um, I don't know how to say today, uh, there are new way, but let's say handicapped children and children with problems. Uh, and she, she was the first in Italy to create a special classes, a special school for these kids, because she was convinced that you can improve their, their minds. And only in a second time, she started to work with, the, let's say, healthy children, children without problems. Uh, so that's very interesting because uh, it was studying the special education uh, that she realized that probably we had to change the normal education. Huh? And, and that's also, quite unusual. She, 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 she started working to, about uh, working her ideas in the asylum for, for, mad, for mad people where the children were put at the time. And then she, she went on uh, with the normal kids and she, she had great results. That's why she, she became what she had become. The other thing, uh, thing important to say uh, when you describe the life of this woman is that she became very famous all of a sudden. Uh, when she was doing uh, this work with the ch children, she was in Rome, uh, nine, 1907, 1908. She had such great results that all of a sudden people from around, mainly from America and, uh, and UK and France started to be very interested in her. So she, she found herself uh, on the spotlight and probably she didn't expect this. She wasn't really ready for this. And uh, so it was not easy to, to deal. Uh, in, at the center of my book is the, the I would say the, 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 the problem of dealing with the notorious, not with being famous, being rich at a certain point and being powerful. And she was not so prepared about this. She, she made also, also some mistakes, I would say. I yeah. don't know what you think, Gina, but no, she was not always good in- uh, No, in fact, no. And I like <laughs> the way you, in your book, um, <laughs> you, you know, you treat her very nicely. And at the same time, though, you don't hide the truth. <laughs> so <it's been> yeah. <laughs> no, no, because, no. because she's, been, she's been, you know, a very controversial person. You know, many, she had, she made mistakes. Um, she, she had a lot of people against her. Uh, but, but also you say that she had a lot of closed doors that she was able, I think, uh, you know, while reading your book, that she was able to kind of find a way to re either reopen them or just turn the other way and find another opportunity. I really think she was amazing in catching the right opportunity every time. Uh, but she also had a lot of disappointment, a lot of disappointment. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, B. Amore asks if you can please talk about some of the difficulties that she had during her life, and it's both from and it's both in her personal life and his, in her professional life. Yeah, first of all, she was a woman. She was unmarried. She was uh, unemployed. Um, so she had. Not, she wasn't rich. Uh, so she had to find uh, support for, for her ideas. And she, she wasn't supported by the public um, institution in Italy, or she was supported at the beginning, but then she, 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 had, a, she had problem with the, with the major in Rome, with the people in Milano. So the, the main problem Maria Montessori had as a young doctor was that she was... Uh, she wasn't supported by the Italian government, let's say in Rome, and she had to find supporters elsewhere. And that's what, what, when the Montessori method was born in a bidonville in, a, in Rome became the method for the rich kids. Because in fact, she was uh, financed by, you know, Anglo-Saxon elite uh, from, from London, from New York. And, um, that was a, a big problem for her. She had to support uh, support herself 
and sometimes she had to make some decision to to go with the with the money to go with the with the help uh, she had many problems in, in her personal life she was um she was uh, she had this uh, child when she was quite young out of uh, marriage she refused to marry the the father of her child and she had to she she was separated from her son for um, until the the kid was uh, was a teenager so that was very painful for her uh, and then she she got re, 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 how to say she got uh, she she took the, the son uh, she she found a way to to get the, the son back uh, and we 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 saw Mario in, in one of the picture um, and I would say third the problem was that she met a lot of um, resistance to her ideas on one side she she met a lot of enthusiasm because it's difficult today to to imagine the the enthusiasm she, she created around her she was a kind of a prophet prophetess i would say she there were mainly girls and it's very interesting she was uh, she was gathering a lot of women supports uh, or her, her followers were young women uh, and I think not only because at that time, in, in particular, women were uh, teachers, but also because um, it was the time when it was the, 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 the years before the, the First World War, when women didn't have a lot of possibility to, to be on the public stage and to change the world. So probably Maria Montessori was also um, a, a inspirational for a lot of women uh, of her generation uh, who found in her message uh, a way of you know channeling uh, that they are enthusiasm their um, idea of changing the world so uh, she met ent enthusiasm but she met also a lot of resistance uh, she was always fighting with someone uh, in italy in america in uh, in spain uh, and that was partly because of her bad bad character she was a very authoritarian person she was uh, a control freak she wanted to control everything about her ideas but on this on the other side i think she met a lot of problem resistance also because as we were saying at the beginning she was very radical so her ideas were difficult to accept for for the teachers for the ministry of uh, instruct public instruction and, and for the let's say the decision makers of the time and she didn't want her method to be changed modified or adapted or contaminated or mixed, by anything else or mixed, uh, contaminated by others that, that's that's the, that's the probably the thing i reproach her most mm -hmm, uh, I agree. Uh, of course it's difficult because i wasn't i wasn't maria montessori i wasn't wasn't there but uh, probably when you have a, a great idea you you always have to to decide if you want to share this idea with everyone and let the idea go around the world uh, and fertilize the world, but also to, to be changed, to be contaminated, or if you want, as she, she did, control this idea uh, in, uh, to, to, to be sure that she, she remains pure. And probably this was a mistake from her, but we are still talking about her today, so yeah i mean i mean i can only imagine to be a woman with at one point in a, in a book you say somebody uh you know probably some people blamed her because she was a woman and she created an enterprise so nowadays ah it's easy but i'm pretty sure that in those times to have created such an empire uh you know an economical too it must have been really hard. So I, I don't know. I feel that she had to defend a little bit also what she kind of uh, preached or, or, you know, or studied. Um, we have a couple of interesting questions. Uh, we you. have Susanina is asking, uh, why do you think the Montessori way of teaching isn't more mainstream? Uh, do you understand mainstream? Yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, uh, probably I'm not sure about the answer. Uh, I think, uh, I repeat once again, because it's very radical. 
it it requires um, a complete change of set mind, uh, and it requires to the uh, a great work. Uh, it requires to the teachers to make a a lot of work on themselves, and that's uh, not easy for an adult because uh, I don't know. I don't know in America, but in Italy or in when I. Very often, when I talk to young people, uh, they go, they get out of this, the university, and they say, for example, they are biologists or they are a mathematician, and they say, if I don't find a job, I will, I will go and I will become a teacher at school, like uh, you know, Plan B. But in fact, being a teacher is a very difficult job, uh, and that's what Maria Montessori was saying since the beginning. It, it's not for everyone to be a teacher. And the Montessori method is very demanding for a teacher. Mm, it doesn't, it's not enough to have the material. It's not enough to have the, the class. You have to, to change a little bit the way you are as an adult. So that's probably the, I think the main, the main difficulty. And the other problem is that Maria Montessori is not a theorician. I was a theorist. I was, you say terrorist, as I was saying. So it's also difficult to, to train, I think, to be a, a good Montessori teacher because uh, uh, Maria Montessori was always observing, creating, uh, changing. So uh, that's probably also the, the problem. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an amazing idea, but it, uh, it's not easy to perform. Yeah, and I don't know that it wasn't was ever has ever been mainstream. I think it has always been related to certain schools and in certain areas. So um, it continues to be. There is another question, Chiara, that I think it could be interesting. The one about the second one, maybe. Yeah, and this is also an interesting part of her uh, um, life. The relationship, how much of a role did Catholicism play in the development of her work? She had a very... Mm, I can't hear you. You... I muted ah, myself okay. by mistake. She had a very strange relationship uh, with religion, right? Absolutely, that was a complete surprise for me. I didn't know about this. Uh, she 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 had a Catholic uh, upbringing. Every, every Italian of the time who were not socialists or, or communists, she was uh, no communism wasn't created yet. She was um, she had a kind of I would say a religion crisis when she lost a child for sure. Uh, she thought about getting inside a religious uh, congregation. But um, I think that uh, she was uh, smart enough to, uh, to keep separated uh, her religion's faith from uh, her uh, work as a scientist. And that's why she didn't create a Catholic uh, Pedago pedagogy. Um, I prefer to, to say that she she was very spiritual, uh, and that's interesting because Gina was talking about uh, her as being a positivist, uh, a scientist. But in fact, she was half a scientist and half a spiritual person, and that was a very interesting mix because she sometimes she was. Uh, how can I say, uh, she was open to miracle, is open to be surprised because she has this idea that uh, life is also spiritual. So uh, Maria Montessori was definite, definitely a Catholic woman uh, and she developed for a, a certain period uh, um, a pedagogy for Catholic kids in uh, Spain but she, she kept repeating, repeating all her life that she, religion and the, the education of a child were separated things. She, she thought that the child was a natural religious creature, which I think it's, it's true, uh, so that you don't need to, to give him uh, information. You just had to let him blossom and the child is naturally in communication with, uh, with the cosmos. Uh, but I was, I would say I was uh, admired by the way she managed to keep the, the two elements separated and to, uh, to, 
to have this method that, that spread around the world in India, in Japan, without uh, difference, without, um, without problem with other religion and other culture. And she was in fact, uh, um, sometimes she was even, the, the Vatican and the Catholic Church was, were quite, let's say, um, divided on her, about her. She had some support, but she had also some problem because she was, she was a free mind, free spirit. She she couldn't, you know, stay in a box. But yes, for me, it was a, a big surprise to discover the spiritual side of Maria Montessori. That's quite. Um, uh, I think that's something that the Montessori family and movement movement tend to a little bit to to put aside. In, right. um, almost every that could be a sin, I would say today, you know, in a more mm -hmm. secular um, uh, society. But we have right. also to understand we are talking about another time. So that's I don't right. see why we have to hide this. I agree. And yes, that's true. The, the, the church actually had this, I was reading in your book, they you know, had, she, she, you know, they didn't necessarily like her um, method precisely because she talks about this freedom, this idea. Well, the, the church, especially at the time, was pretty, you know, discipline, uh, rules, and, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, a, a quite interesting relationship with the, with, the, with the religion. It was mostly personal, I should say. Chiara, do you want to ask, look for, uh, ask more questions? We have so many questions. I'm very many, happy right. that, that, that the attendees are kind of curious about her and about uh, uh, our author, Christina, here. So, you know, let me see. Um, uh, John is, uh, is asking, Christina, I wonder if you came across anything that might show that her contemporary Pierre de Chardin had any influence on each other. They both were scientists, scientists, keen observers, interested in cosmic education and peace. They both experienced censure, censura for the work they did. I wonder if their paths ever crossed. Mm. Ah, sorry, I was I was looking at the chat, but there is another question and ask. Yeah, the okay. question and answer, the le domande. <laughs> Uh, uh, no, um, I never found any evidence of, um, but Maria Montessori was uh, of uh, a relationship or exchange with Pierre de Chardin, but I mean, which is an amazing uh, per, uh, character, but uh, in general, it's quite a surprise that Maria Montessori was so focused on her work that she, you rarely find in her letters and epistolary any reference to, I don't know, World War II, the, the Shoah, the persecution of Jews. She was completely in her um, So she rarely exchanged with, uh, with other people outside her inner circle, I would say, so. And how about fascism, Anthony's mm, asking? Yeah, that's another, um, but there are also, also questions, sorry, Chiara, also on the chat, huh? for example. Yeah, both, can... both, both, both. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at everything. In any case, fascism, um, of course, it's a, it's a long uh, story. Uh, Maria Montessori uh, tried to collaborate with the, the Mussolini regime for almost 10 years, uh, which is not uh, a little uh, period of time. Uh, she was um, she was living in Spain at the at the time, and in twenty two she was called by the Italian government before the access of Mussolini to power uh, to revise certain schools. So the, the, there was a minister minister who was very close to her at the time. So when Mussolini took the power, um, and Mussolini was a, a was a teacher when he was a younger, was a school teacher. Uh, he was quite. Uh, fascinated by Maria Montessori. And I think he wanted also to, to use the name of Maria Montessori you know, as a na national uh, treasure. So he invited her to change the school uh, in Italy. And, and uh, it was quite funny to see that uh, Mussolini was so enthusiastic, but behind him, behind him this, the whole Italian school was absolutely decided not to follow him. Uh, and so very soon Maria Montessori had a lot of problem with the, with the teacher, with the, um, the, I would say, dirigenti, let's say, the, the, 
the school system in Italy. So she didn't break up with the fascism because, uh, because of the ideology. She, she, she decided to, re to resign and to go back to Spain because she, she couldn't work in Italy because of the opposition of the school uh, directors. Uh, and in fact, she was quite, um, it's absolutely uh, an historical lie to say that Maria Montessori was an anti-fascist. She, was, she wasn't at all an opposite, opposite of um, Mussolini. She was quite an admirer of him. Uh, to partial excuse this, we have to say that we are talking about the first Mussolini. Uh, and in the in the 20s, uh, the first Mussolini was considered by other people in Europe, Chamberlain, uh, a new thing. Uh, then very soon uh, in the 30s, uh, the, the regime uh, became, uh, let's say, hard. Uh, so Maria, um, I would say that Maria Montessori was ready to work with the devil. To, to get where she, where she wanted to go. So probably that's why she, she decided to go back to Italy. But in fact, her method was uh, difficult to, to put aside uh, in, uh, to the ideology of a dictatorship. So very soon in the, in the beginning, in the first, uh, I would say uh, Mussolini uh, began to uh, transform the school to, let's say to, Fascistizzare the Italian school in 1930, 1931. For example, when he imposed the, the you know, the all the teacher, all the professor to to swear, to swear. To swear. Uh, so <laughs> until then, they Maria Montessori stay uh, try to work with them, but very soon uh, she realized it was impossible. And Christina, uh, this, this is probably uh, sorry, I interrupted you. You want to say? No, I want to finish. say. I think really that she was ready to work to everyone. Um, she she tried to work with the, with the, with the Soviet Union. Uh, the only country where she couldn't really even try was uh, uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, Hitler regime shut down every Montessori school a few weeks after he took power. But in other situation, Maria Montessori was quite. Uh, um, how do you say, I can say in Italian, um, say molto, there is, a, there is a, a word in Italian to say that you are ready to work to, with everyone. I would, in any case, she was like this, she was sometimes... Disponibile. Disponibile. Un po' di più. Um, beh, it will come, it will come when I'm not thinking about it. Opportunista, <laughs> you know, really, really. ci dicono, opportunista. Ci suggeriscono, opportunist. Opportunista, esatto. Grazie, Michelle. <laughs> well, and this could be probably one of the reasons why in Italy, or maybe for some uh, pedagogists in Italy, uh, or this is like a stain on her, on her um, I'm thinking about people like Rodari or some other um, who came a little later, obviously, quite later actually, uh, than Montessori, who, um, and certain pedagogists in Italy who condemned her for being, one, having a method that is too individualized, too individualistic, versus something that could be more collective, for example. And, and, and therefore also her support for fascism could be because we had this question uh, with Chiara that, that is to say, and that I think it links with another questions I saw in the chat that is why uh, there are what 3000 schools uh, in the United States of Montessori and there are just 137 officially registered school Montessori schools in Italy, uh, right? I guess. Mm. Christina, I, I don't know why. I, I don't know why Italy didn't follow Maria Montessori. Uh, probably the, I think the presence of the church was something uh, at the time. Um, probably, I probably also the, the I think that the, that it, there was something in in America that met her spirit. I don't know, I, I'm not an expert of America, but probably the, this idea of freedom, this idea of uh, being being the, the master of your own life, not it's, that's very American. So, and that was not very Italian at the time. It, Italy, 
I was really surprised when I was working on this book to discover my own country 100 uh, years from from here, from now. It was another country. It was a very um, uh, dice, un po arretrato. I don't I don't know how to say. Um, and uh, so for Maria Montessori was not an easy place to to talk. And in fact, the, it's interesting that the, the institution that uh, followed her um, more in Italy was the Humanitaria in Milano, the, let's say the la punta of the um, long, long, del socialismo, so the Italian socialism. But for the rest of Italy, for the um, common culture, her ideas were too much, I would say, I think. But I don't know. I don't. I don't have the answer to this question. I don't know. She was not a prophet in in her own country. That's for sure. Now we have a lot of questions, and we don't have time to answer them all and comments too. But um, uh, and in fact, <laughs> and in fact, answers. Yes. I, you know, there are some also some very interesting comments. Uh, Michael Rosanova is, uh, you know, he, he said that he, he was a head of school of an American Montessori Society school for 20 years. Wow. I cannot test that mixing Montessori ideas with non Montessori ideas is a disaster which undermines Montessori's ideals and also leads to teacher burnout. This is interesting, right? Oh, and, Absolutely, no, no, but I, uh, I, I can't, I, I'm not judging Maria Montessori. And she, she was saying the, the same thing that Michael says, uh, that she was saying that uh, it doesn't work if yeah. you mix up. Uh, yeah. Probably she, I respect, uh, I think she was a genius, so probably she was right. But I would say that uh, in this um, attempt to, to protect everything, probably she missed some opportunity to, to spread more the ideal, but probably there is something true in what Michael is saying. Uh, no, it's very interesting, Deborah, about teaching math. I'm not at all a, a, an expert, uh, but I just wanted to say that I, during my research, I, I made a training on the material in, in Bergamo because I wanted to understand each set of the material. And I was absolutely blown away by the mat mathematical material of Maria Mathieu. She, she really creates something super interesting and that's the, her own creation. It was not based on the French uh, master of her because she, she was able to, it's, I, I can't explain it in English, but she created this system of the little pearls that, that um, express the, the, how do you say, Gina, the, 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 the decine, tens. The tens, yes. Ten. Mm -hmm. And, and the amazing thing is that the child can touch the numbers and can manipulate them and can, for example, can have in his own hands uh, the idea of, uh, um, how do you say, elevare a potenza. Um, Ele uh, when you, the nobody can say it, even the comes, comes to it. Logic for me, maybe someone from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you do 10 for 10 and which 100 multiply and the, and the power the power the power, the power. thank I, you I audience <laughs> i i had all 10 and nine. i was very high i had very high grade at school i am the typical i was the typical very good student and today i'm a zero with math i'm really a, a mathematical idiot so when i saw this material i said to myself why I didn't have this when I was a kid of three or four? Because I think that the mathematical, the mat mathematical material of Maria Montessori is absolutely uh, brilliant. It's uh, superlative. Uh, probably you, you, you get this um, concept for life, I would say, really. I was impressed. I read somewhere that she essentially was going back to this idea of mathematics through geometry, so through a, through a conceptual, not through a conceptual, uh, that is very typical of her way of thinking, conceptual idea, um, process, but through a manual one. So the children, so geometry, which has shapes and images, it's the it's best way to introduce children to, to math or something like that. I'm not an expert, obviously, as you can see. Janikesh, she also always talking about being practical 
No, right. she she wants right. to she doesn't start from the abstraction, but she start from practical, and um, that's why when I saw this material, I was uh, I was really impressed. I think she in, in that case she was uh, she was she had, she had she had something. She really um, was able to yes to 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 concretize a uh, concept. Uh, I don't yes. know if you can say this. Yes. And so it's yes. very interesting. And another, I, I was, I, I saw another question about high school. Um, I'm not an expert, but I, when I was in Holland, because I went a lot of time in Holland uh, visiting the archive, I, I visited one, um, not high school, but just before the college in France, I, from 11 to 13. Middle uh, school, middle school. Middle school. And I was really impressed because uh, seeing a pre because he, maternal school okay uh, kids are very special creatures so, but when you see, see you see preteens teenager of uh, 11 12 wor working in silence all around the place in group or alone in in um, you I was uh, I was visiting I was. Um, let's say experiences what, what she was saying that the problem of school is the concept of attention how can I get the attention of a kid and she say you you can't have the attention of a kid only the kid can create his own attention if he has a desire to learn so in that school in, in Amsterdam I really saw this this uh, teenager where where were working because they had a desire to understand it. They very they were very happy to do that. There was not was nobody saying, keep calm, listen to me, because there was a something coming from inside. So for me it was a great experience to to watch this, to be honest. That's where probably as Michael uh, wrote, uh, you can you can take uh, you can have a, a 13 years old and put him in a Montessori class you have to 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 work on a, on a kid since he's is very little probably to to get there very sweetly victoria wrote um, her method helped my sons find their love of math and are both engineers now oh that's sweet um I want to conclude this uh, amazing because we could go on for hours uh, talking about uh, Maria Montessori, right? You know, and um, but I would like to know about you, Christina. How did you research? Uh, because this is a very thorough uh, script, a, a very thorough study of uh, of Maria Montessori. Um, I think you used different um, sources. So how did you research and also why did you decide to write a biography about Maria Montessori? I, I don't know why. To be honest, I don't know why because not, nothing linked, linked me to her. I'm not especially fan of kids. I didn't went to a Montessori school. Um, I think that I, I like strong women and I was reading something about her in a, in a newspaper. I was surprised discovering she was she she died in in fifty two in Holland. And I say, what she's doing in Holland? And so I I searched, you know, Wikipedia basically, and I realized that there were very few information about her. And so since I'm I'm a bi biographer of women, I. I think I was attracted by this uh, contradiction. You have a, a name, Montessori, which is a very strong brand everywhere, but you have a, you have a woman which is not very known as a person. So I, I started to, to, to search, to look. It was not very easy because uh, at the beginning, the Montessori archive were not very, you know, easy for me uh, being outside the movement, but I found a way and found incredible people who helped a lot. And um, also I, I was I had a nice surprise to see that if you look for material on her, there, there, there are a lot of unedited material. I discovered really a lot of uh, letters, uh, 
uh, archives in Italy, in Spain. So in the end, it was, uh, it was not easy to research on her. She, there, there is still a lot of people who doesn't want to share information or material, but it was, uh, I think it was time to, to make this uh, work. Of course, any biography is just, uh, you know, is the, it's never defi definitive. Probably in the future there will be other material, but I think it, uh, it was time to try to. For me, it was time to try to explain Maria Montessori to the larger public because she's very well known in the movement. But uh, I think it was time to 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 let uh, the common readers to to know about her life and uh, not only the the the, the method. So. I work uh, five, five, five years about this book. It was, uh, it was, I would, I think it was my, it was the more difficult of my books because, um, because she's always talking about her job, her work. She was obsessed by, she was a workaholic. So I was very worried about the final result. I, I was worried about writing a very boring book. Uh, and that's why I try to do very short chapters. I try to, because I, I, I knew that she was a very serious woman, uh, very focused on, on her. And uh, so I, I remember that the, my main, uh, um, I was worried about, yes, I was worried about um, how, can, I, how can explain to, to, to people that she was um, such a, a complex figure. And in the end, I was also surprised to discover a lot of um, uh, exciting element in her life, like the personal story with Giuseppe Montesano, the secret son. So it was also fun, I would say, but it was, it was not an easy research. Also because as Chiara said, she's not an easy person. So, you know, when you work on a, a life, in a sense, you have to empathize with this person. And Maria Montessori was not all the time a, an easy person to empathize, I would say. It was a little bit of a struggle sometimes. Well, you made it very interesting. Probably, uh, probably this dichotomy of her being such a, you know, a pioneer, but on the other side to be uh, quite a difficult woman, I think it makes it more interesting. I don't know. I, I really enjoyed it. So uh, I would like to remind you that the translation in English is coming out on March the 8th. You can pre-order it at IM Books. Um, also, re please remember that if you order from, from IM Books as our attendee tonight, you can have a discount of 10% uh, with a code that I just wrote in the, in the chat, but I will write it again. Um, so, I would like to thank you, all of you. First, let me remind everybody that in two days on Thursday, we will have another event, uh, Growing Up Italian. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a discussion about, you know, being Italian-American and being a, a first or second or third generation Italian. So this is going to be very interesting because we will have Marianne Leone. She's an amazing writer and actress too, and uh, uh, Chris Castellani. And then for the series uh, Libriamo, we will have another event on March the 30th with the young writer Claudia Durastanti. She's coming in person. So we will be at the bookstore in person. Also on April 8th, we will have Anne Goldstein, the translator of Elena Ferrante, in person. So I'm very excited to be able finally to see some of you attendees and also our guests in the eyes, look them in the eyes. So yes, Michelle, very excited. I also want to, to, to thank uh, Michael Rosanova that wrote very, very interesting things and all of you, many, many attendees, I will send by email all your questions and comments to both Professor Maiellaro and Cristina so that you guys can read them and you know enjoy them. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, but I would love to talk to, to thank 
Of course, our Consul General uh, of Italy, Federica Sereni, thank you so much for participating. Do you have anything to add, Federica? No, thank you, Chiara, Christina, and Gina. I think it was truly one of the most, as someone commented, heartwarming events that we've had so far. Very interesting, fascinating. I'm a mother myself, and it's very, very interesting to, to, you know, to hear all that you discussed about Maria Montessori, and also I'm a big fan of powerful women, and we have a very talented panel here today. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Consul. Uh, also, of course, thank you to all our speakers. Thank you also to Fitch, Friends of Italian Cultural Center in Boston, Professor Maiellaro and, uh, and Cristina De Stefano. Grazie tantissime for this wonderful conversation. I would go on hours. Mm. Right, Gina? Yeah. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Grazie. Until next time. It was a pleasure, Cristina. See you Ciao. soon. Bye bye. Arrivederci. Ciao. Have a good day. Ciao.